Okay, if Monica's done, we'll start. But of all the people in the room to have to tell to sit down, I just wasn't thinking it would be you. <laughs> You're usually so quiet, Monica. Um, welcome to worship this morning. It's good to have you in this place. I don't have a whole lot of announcements other than to tell you that you should have gotten your um, October newsletter via email this week. Laura sent them out. If you don't receive email, there are copies up here for you to pick up. Feel free to do that. Um, we'll come down the center aisles for communion like usual, eat and drink at the table, return your mask, and then return to your seat, and otherwise continue to stay healthy and well and responsible and, uh, you know, all that stuff. Len's going to play uh, the same prelude that she's played for the other two services, and I'm ready for a change, but nevertheless, I'll sit through it. And thank you to John Dyer for singing yet once again. At the end of, at the end of today, um, at the end of this morning, we'll have heard um, 12 verses of How Great Thou Art. <laughs> and if you stick around, maybe he'll sing one during education time. So immediately after the service, we have to just switch computers quick. I gotta go plug it in up here so it goes over the screen because um, Terry refused to bring one to, uh, to do Zoom for Maryland to watch on. Um, but we'll quick do the computer thing and then we will have um, our second edition of intergenerational study on racism this morning. So feel free to stay right where you are. If you'd like to stay for that, if you don't wanna stay, just walk out the door. Let's uh, quiet everything and prepare our hearts for worship during Lynn's prayer. <laughs> the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You. Let us pray. Holy God, we know that we don't live up to your expectations. We know that we grumble about going into the vineyard to proclaim your divine goodness. So we ask for your forgiveness and we seek hearts that are compassionate and willing to put our faith into action. Thank you for your gracious gifts. In your name we pray. Amen. The Gospel lesson today is from the 21st chapter of Matthew. And Laura, I was just wondering, would you mind reading it in Greek for us this morning? Because she's taking Greek, you know. She's had three classes. Now I don't know why she can't read this. <laughs> when Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching. And, he, and they said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. 
Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then do you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. Then Jesus said to them, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Jesus spoke. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and he said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went. The father went to the second son and asked the same thing. And this son answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after that you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Well, that gospel lesson, although it's all connected in the Bible, really kind of feels like it has two separate parts to it. If we had longer than a six-minute sermon, we'd look at a deeper way that those parts are interconnected. But, to, but since my time is short, we're just going to talk about the, the two major components of each part. So in that first part, Jesus is asked by people in authority for his, to present his credentials. You know what credentials are. You present credentials when you apply for a job or when you apply for school. Um, oftentimes they tell other people who we are. Today we often use resumes to do that. Jesus is asked by the people in authority what authority he does, by what authority he does those things, and then who gave Jesus that authority. Now, he has three possible answers. He could answer with God, he could answer with Satan, or he could answer with himself. And any one of those three answers would have gotten him into, him into deep trouble with the temple authorities. Because the motivation for the question really has nothing to do with where the authority comes from. The motivation is to trick Jesus. The people, the scribes and the elders who ask the question want to trap Jesus. They want to find a way to take away his credibility, which is growing rapidly in the community. So Jesus pulls a typical Jesus. He doesn't answer the question. That forces those interrogators to have to figure out the answer on their own. And therefore, today you and I must figure out the answer on our own as well. You and I must use our history and our tradition and our holy scriptures to decide who Jesus is and where Jesus' authority comes from. And that's not an easy thing to do. And for some people it becomes so difficult that they just walk away because they simply can't find an answer that fits for them. And that's not unusual. I mean, that, that's kind of how it is, because part of the problem here, part of the problem of accepting Jesus as the Messiah, as the one sent from God, is that there's no scientific evidence. Because this is a, something we do because of our faith, not because we can prove something. And so the question is, where will we place our faith? Where do you put your faith? And today, that gospel text starts by inviting you to place your faith in a God who gave you a Savior. And then we move on to the second part. It's a parable that Jesus tells. It's a parable that Jesus tells about workers going out into the vineyard. There's a lot of vineyards in the New Testament. Um, apparently, a lot of wine drinking going on because they're always in a vineyard doing something. The parable talks about what to do with that faith that's discussed in the first part of the reading. If you have faith, what do you do with it? Very applicable for our lives right now, today. Many folks, many folks claim that they will be faithful to God 
And they claim, like that first son, that they will go out into the vineyard and to work for God's justice and mercy. But you know what happens? They never go. People in our world can easily claim obedience to God, but then not live that obedience out in the real, in the real world. Douglas Hare is a professor of New Testament at Pittsburgh Seminary, that's an ELCA seminary, at least in Pittsburgh. <laughs> He's, that's not where Laura is going. She's going to the correct seminary, that would be Wartburg in Dubuque. Hare says that many of us say that we are going out into work into the vineyard, but instead of going out and harvesting grapes, we spend our time rearranging the stones along the path. I like that. I'm going to say that one more time. Many of us say that we're going out to work in the vineyard, but instead of harvesting grapes, we spend our time rearranging the stones along the path. And Hare says, like you already know, that's pointless. It serves no purpose. In our weekly Bible study in the book of James, which we just finished last week, but we're going to go on, so if anybody wants to join us at 9.30 on Wednesday mornings, we meet right in here. But the author of James routinely claims throughout that short book that faith without works is dead. Faith and Aiden, I mean, Spencer, you should pay very close attention to this, because eventually you're going to have to write a faith paper for confirmation. And so you need to remember that James says faith, the book of James says faith without works is dead faith. The author, whoever it is, he or she claims that if you profess that you're going to be faithful to God, then you must put that profession into action. You must exercise your faith out in the world. If you claim obedience, then you should live obedience. So you probably already received the newsletter via email, or some of you have picked it up from the table this morning. It doesn't necessarily mean you've read it just because you got it on your email. But this month I would invite you to read my letter that I wrote for the newsletter. For those of you who don't know, I write a letter every month and put it in the newsletter. Okay, that might be a surprise to some people, but it's there. This month, I talk about the difficulty of putting our faith into action when we go out into the vineyard of the polling booth in November. As every one of us knows, there has never been a perfect candidate to vote for, and there probably never will be. So therefore, it becomes our responsibility as faith-based people to look at the entirety of a candidate's ideas and platforms and promises, and then try to figure out how they best align with our faith and our call to love God and to love our neighbors. Okay, that's a hard thing to do. There's some people out there that simply vote for a candidate because of one position that they hold, and never look at the entirety of their platform. Doing that is simply being blind to the whole person. As faith-based people, selecting any candidate should be a difficult task for us. And I know from talking to many of you, it is. But that's part of what it means to put our faith into action. That's what it means to live our obedience, struggling with things like that. We are living our obedience and not just proclaiming. So I don't have to tell you this, you already know that we're experiencing a great surge in expressing racial concern in our community and in our society right now. When we come into this space for worship, we come here expressing faith in a God who regularly asks us to work for justice and peace in the world. The Jesus that we come here and that we claim to love so dearly calls on us, remember these words in Matthew? Jesus calls on us to feed those who are hungry, to provide water to those who are thirsty, to visit those who are sick and in prison, to welcome the stranger in our midst, and to give clothing to anyone who can't afford it. And then after Jesus makes that call to us, he gets even a little more frightening because he adds to that, 
When you do it to the least of those who live in our society, you are doing it to him. Remember that? It's easy for us to come here and sit in these comfortable chairs in a climate-controlled and sanctuary where, because of a new boiler system, we're going to actually have um, steady heat this winter. It's easy to come here and sit in these chairs with full stomachs or knowing that we're going to head out for some food pretty soon. It's easy to sit in here and proclaim what a beautiful sentiment Jesus' call to justice is. It's much more difficult to walk out of that glass door later on this morning and to go out into the world and to work for justice, particularly racial justice. But when we say that we have faith, we are saying that we trust those words, that we trust that call from Jesus to be true. And then, if we really use the Bible as our guide for life, we have to take those words, and the words of the book of James, faith without works is dead, we have to take those words seriously. We have to take that faith, take it out of this room, and put it into action. Or as the parable in today's lesson points out, we have to go out into the vineyard and exercise our obedience to the God we claim to love. So John Dyer is going to sing the hymn this morning, It's How Great Thou Art. Many of you know it. Over the years, countless people have come to me to tell me how much they love this hymn. And I always wonder when they tell me that. Why is it that they love this hymn? Is there some warm sentimentality to it? Or do they actually appreciate the hymn because they want to live out the words and show the world how great God is? Because if we like the hymn because we truly believe that God is very great, then we are truly called to be the ones to get off our couches and these comfy chairs in the sanctuary and to go out into the vineyard and to put our faith into action. Amen. John, will you come forward, please? Thank you.
On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples after breaking it and said, this is my body. It's given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all of them to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And together we pray the traditional words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come and eat. The meal has been prepared for you, and this table is the Lord's who invites you all to dine this morning.
In this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Love God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. Thanks be to God. Amen. For those of you who are staying, I'll just move the computer. If you'd like to leave, you can depart at this time.